Well, good afternoon. If I forget to say it at the end, I don't want to uh, overlook saying how wonderful it has been to be with you these past two days. One of the things that I really like about coming to Canada and to CMU in particular is the kind of hospitality that just radiates uh, from this place. Um, that, that isn't always the way it is. Um, <laughs> I was preaching in Florida uh, one Sunday, and I flew down on Saturday, and I was met at the airport by an officer of the congregation and his wife, and they said, welcome to Florida. I said, great. I said, listen, uh, you're not going to be staying in a hotel tonight. You're going to be staying at our house. And I said, fine, sounds great. He said, and it's a good night to be there because once a month, our church school class gets together for a potluck, and it's tonight, and you'll get a chance to meet some people from the church. I said, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I was standing in line at the potluck, and I was just trying to make small talk with the woman in front of me, and I said, it looks like it might rain. I hope that doesn't hurt attendance at church tomorrow. And she turned around and said, it doesn't make any difference to me. I'm not going anyway. There's a guest minister in town. And, uh, <laughs> I will confess that it fe felt good when she crawled under the buffet table when they introduced me later in the evening. <laughs> Well, our, our um, conversation this afternoon is going to be about funeral sermons, preaching at funerals. And probably the most celebrated funeral preacher of all Christian history was a French priest by the name of Jacques Bousset. He was born to privilege in Dijon, France, from uh, a father who was an attorney and well-connected politically and wealthy. Um, he wanted his son to have an excellent education, so he sent Jacques to Paris to the University of Navarre, where he studied classics, and when he finished his classical education, he was taught theology by Jesuits, and then he presented himself for ordination, and he became priest. He was brilliant, he was articulate, he had felicity with the language and expression, he was handsome, he had a velvety voice, and he rose quickly in the ranks of the clergy, all the way to the point that he got the plum of plums of appointments. He became the chaplain to the royal court of Louis XIV, the Sun King. Uh, he knew which side of the bread was buttered, and he quickly became an advocate for the divine right of kings, <laughs> which pleased Louis XIV greatly. He was a great preacher, but his congregation were generally just the intimates of the royal family at mass and chapel. Uh, but at his great public occasions were royal funerals, when all of the aristocracy of France would come and hear this dazzling orator sanitize these royals and turn them into saints in his funeral sermons. But he had a particular challenge with the funeral of Princess Anne of Gonzaga who was a nasty person. Uh, in Louisiana, in the States, we would call her a mean, spiteful, razor-toting woman. <laughs> she was a backstabbing gossip, and everybody hated Princess Anne. And to make things worse, right before she got sick and died, she felt it necessary to publish an autobiography. She hired a ghostwriter, and she said to the ghostwriter, tell it all. And the ghostwriter did all of the vicious, vile, salacious, disgusting pieces of her life were out there for everybody to read. It was the hottest selling book in Paris. And then she gets sick and dies, and Jacques Bousset has the responsibility of preaching her funeral. He started out, as everyone hoped he would, by telling some of those salacious stories. He wasn't telling secrets. Everybody had already read them in the book, but they delighted in hearing them at her funeral. But then he pivoted and said, unbeknownst to all of you, right before she died, Christ appeared to her, and she converted to the holy Catholic faith. 
It was a remarkable experience, more remarkable perhaps than even Christ touching the Apostle Paul's eyes on the Damascus Road and the scales falling from his eyes. Oh, would that all who feel distant from God would be here today so that they could model themselves after this remarkable transformation that we have seen before us. <laughs> Voltaire happened to be at the funeral. <clears throat> <clears throat> And afterwards he said, hmm, <laughs> Boswe said it happened. He seemed to believe that it happened. I guess we should join him in that belief, even though it is a joke. <laughs> now, Boswe was not alone. There were many, he was simply the best of the breed. There were many in Europe who found it necessary in eulogies to make believe and whitewash the people who were being buried. Not only that, funerals had become deceptive themselves, pomp and circumstance devoid of gospel. So much so that those who left Europe for North America as a part of their religious quest brought with them an antipathy to funerals and funeral sermons. Uh, funerals were to be lean in North America and funeral sermons, if they were present at all, were to be spare. The most severe reaction is probably from my own tradition, the Reformed tradition. The Puritans came over to Massachusetts. They brought with them the fairly new directory for the public worship of God. Uh, listen to what that directory says about the burial of the dead. Listen to this. When any person departeth this life, let the dead body upon the day of burial be decently attended from the house to the place appointed for burial, and they are immediately interred without any ceremony. Praying, reading, and singing, both in going to and at the grave, have been grossly abused and are in no way beneficial to the dead and have proved injurious to the living. Therefore, let all such things be laid aside. No ceremony. No prayer, no song, no nothing. Now the Puritans in Massachusetts converted some of the native folk that they encountered when they arrived and turned them not only into Christians but into Puritans. Right after this, one of these native people died and his comrades prepared the body, wrapped him in a shroud, and carried him into the woods for burial. A Puritan named Thomas Shepard followed this band of native people, curious about what they would do. When they got out into the forest, they dug a grave, they placed the body of their friend in the grave, and then, like good Puritans, they stood at the grave looking in, but saying or doing nothing. Finally, one of the native people, a man named Tuta Swampe, couldn't take it anymore. And he finally opened his mouth and preached the gospel. Uh, Shepherd doesn't record the words of the sermon in his journal, but he says they were powerful and they led us all to prayer. Now, between the Puritans who did too little and Jacques Bousset who did way too much, I want us to let Tuta Swampe be the patron saint of funeral preachers. Those who stand there and speak because a word must be spoken and speak a word that leads to prayer. Now, as we think about what constitutes a good funeral sermon, I want us to think this afternoon about the funeral sermon not in isolation from the rest of the funeral service, but as one piece of a total liturgical and community event. And what I want to do is to name eight goals of the funeral, eight things that a good funeral would accomplish, and then sometimes the sermon is the instrument by which one or more of those goals is accomplished. This keeps us from doing a template kind of funeral. Now, I know ministers who have 100 funerals a year. That's two a week, and it gets uh, almost irresistible to have in your mind a kind of formula that you use for a funeral homily or sermon. 
What I'm calling us to do in the best of circumstances is to think about this death and this family and this community and this moment and to think about what best accomplishes the goals of the funeral might be the prayer here and it might be the uh, hymn there and it might be a creedal statement over here and it might be liturgical drama uh, over here. But to think about which one of these or cluster of these is best accomplished by the sermon. Now, the first of these goals is a good funeral is charismatic. And what that means is the gospel gets proclaimed. It's amazing at how many funerals the gospel is not proclaimed. Uh, and that's uh, partly because it's been hijacked by psychological grief management, as we talked about yesterday. But it's also the general muteness of uh, preachers uh, in the face of death to proclaim the resurrection. Many pieces of the funeral are charismatic. But keep in mind, as Dan reminded us yesterday in the Bible study, at every funeral, there are two preachers. There's you, and there's capital D, death. Little d, death is biological death, and sometimes little d, death comes as a friend. Capital D, death is not our friend. Capital D, death is the enemy, and capital D, death loves to preach. And the sermon that capital D, death preaches at every funeral is, Damn all of you, I win every time. I destroy all loving relationships. I undermine all promises. I defeat all community. And if you want evidence, there it is. And it is our duty and delight to shake our fist in the face of capital D death and say, oh death, where's your sting? Where is your victory? I tell you a mystery. A number of years ago, Leslie Stahl was the CBS News correspondent for the White House uh, in Washington. And one afternoon, there was a late-breaking event at the White House. This was during the Reagan administration. And Leslie Stahl got it on the wire and rushed over to the White House to cover it. It was a controversial thing that had been done by the Reagan administration. And she filed, in time for the evening news, a very critical report. But she did not have time to do any video. She didn't have time to take a video crew with her. So she simply borrowed some stock footage from the White House Office of Communication. And so while she was giving her critical report on the screen, there was a picture of President Reagan with a flag waving behind him. There was a picture of President Reagan riding a stallion on the beach in California. <laughs> There was a picture of Reagan chopping wood with his shirt off on his ranch. And the next morning, Michael Deaver, head of White House Office of Communication, called Leslie Stahl and said, thank you so much for your report last night. She said, well, I appreciate that, Michael, but it was a critical report of the administration. He said, oh, yeah, your words were critical, but you showed my pictures. And in the battle between the eye and the ear, the eye wins every time. The gospel is a wager that Michael Deaver is wrong because the eye tells us that death has triumphed. And only the proclamation of that which hits the ear, the confession which we have trusted, the promises which are ours, only that calls into question the sermon of capital D, death. I think one of these eight, and it's this one, is probably going to be there in 99.9% .9 of good funeral sermons. We get the chance to proclaim the gospel. Now the gospel we proclaim is that Jesus Christ, who was dead as a doornail on Friday afternoon, was raised from the dead on Easter. And it's important, I think, on some occasions to challenge the sort of implicit understanding that people have of the gospel of resurrection that it's really just a resuscitation. That Jesus, who was dead, was walking around good as new on Sunday. It was kind of a magic trick that God did. But the Gospels make it clear that this is not a resuscitation. This is a glorification. And as a matter of fact, the Gospels 
can't do that in straightforward theological systematic prose, thank God. What they do is they describe the resurrection in ways that are contradictory and complementary to say, this is unlike anything we have ever experienced before. They recognized him and they didn't. He said, touch my side, give me some fish. I'm not a ghost, I have a body. But he also walked through doors. This is a different kind of embodiment. But it's important to proclaim the embodied resurrection because a disembodied Gnostic understanding of the resurrection misses the key victory that's there. Namely, the resurrection is connected to the creation. We have a God who gives us God's self in the material world. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Also, this Jesus wasn't just an epiphenomenon. He taught and he healed and he embraced children and he did things with his body and the resurrection is a validation of that embodiment. You know, you wanna know who I am? Look where I put my body. Look at the things that I say with my mouth. Look at the places that my feet take me. Look at the things that I do with my hands. If you want to know who Tom Long is, uh, look at what Tom Long does with his body. You know, I thought about um, faxing this in this afternoon. Uh, I would have been with you in spirit. <laughs> but I chose to put my body here and so did you. Uh, and the resurrection, the embodied resurrection, is a validation of where Jesus put his body and what he uh, did with it. And as such, it is both a call to repentance and hope. It's a call to repentance because every other way of embodiment is now called into question. This is the way, the truth, and the life. And it is a sign of hope because this is the embodiment that will endure into eternity. This is God's eternal gospel. And as Romans says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, one of the interesting things to me uh, about the risen Christ and our participation in the risen Christ is that in the glorified body of Christ, the wounds are still there. The resurrection is not an eraser of memory of history and woundedness. It is a taking of that wound into the glorified body of the risen Christ. The people we are burying have wounds. Uh, what has made them who they are is in part the tragedies and woundedness. And the funeral sermon uh, announcing the kerygma is never there, there, it's all right, it's all over now. But what has made you human has now been gathered up into the victory of Christ. Now, when I was a boy, there was in my Sunday school class a beautiful um, Sunday school classmate uh, named Joni. Uh, Joni was my friend, and sometimes our parents would take us in the afternoon over to Lawson Naval Station nearby because there was an Olympic-sized swimming pool there, and we could enjoy the pool. The only difference really was that I didn't get polio, but Joni did. She was in an iron lung for over a year. My, my children don't even know what an iron lung is, thanks be to God. But Joni was in an iron lung over a year, and when she finally got out of the iron lung, she spent the rest of her life in braces with her body twisted. She ended up as an art teacher at Georgia State University, and if Joni were to come in that door right now, the energy of joy in this room would go up to 11. 
She simply was God's, one of God's very best pieces of work, and she brought blessing wherever she went. I preached her funeral three years ago. Now, uh, do I think God caused that polio? No. Uh, but if I had a magic wand, uh, could I reach into her life and take out every broken, tragic, damaged, diseased place in order to make her whole? I haven't the wisdom to do that. I have no idea how the struggle and tragedy of her life formed her into a person of joy. I just know that the risen Joni still has the wounds, but they are gathered into the glory. We get to preach that. We get to preach that at funerals. The second goal of a funeral, and I don't mean this in the narrow sacramental sense, is a funeral is Eucharistic. As we heard yesterday when we talk about the history of early Christian funerals, there was a Eucharist, there was a Lord's Supper at graveside. But what the Eucharistic theme has become, even for non-sacramental traditions, is one of the goals of the funeral is to give thanks for the life that God has given us in the person whom we are burying. And we give thanks for the whole life, not just the partial and sanitized life. What did God give us? And this requires a kind of an eschatological vision. When you squint and look at the life of the person, what do you see in terms of the grace of God refracted through that life? Um, I had been at a conference like this several years ago, and uh, after it was over, I got on the plane to go home, and I found myself seated next to one of the other presenters at the conference. And he and I started talking about our lives, and one of the things he told me, he said that he and his wife were the parents of a 35-year-old son who had a, a mental disability that had caused him to move into an early cognitive failure and that he was in a cognitive assistance home. He said, my wife and I used to visit him every week, but he can't respond to us. He doesn't even recognize us. And to tell you the truth, we stopped loving him. Uh, it's difficult to love someone who never responds. And I'm being honest with you, we stopped loving him. But dutifully we went, not as often, and on one visit we were walking down the hall to his room and we started into his room and suddenly startled back because there was somebody in there with him. I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out it was the Lutheran pastor from the church down the street who every week simply made rounds in this home and made pastoral calls on all of the residents and he was visiting our son. And we were surprised because he was talking to our son as if our son could respond. And then he read a passage of scripture to our son as if our son could understand. And then he prayed with our son as if our son could participate in prayer. And then suddenly for both my wife and me, we realized this pastor was able to see who our son really is. They were able to participate through his ability to catch the vision of the image of God. There's a physician in New York City who, she has a Yale education. She could have a fancy medical office, but her medical office is a Ford Econoline van that she drives around Manhattan looking for women caught in prostitution. Whenever she finds them, she gives them medical care, a word of encouragement, a word of liberation if she can. She was being interviewed by the New York Times, and the New York Times reporter was somewhat uh, appreciative but skeptical. She, she said, you know, that's well and good all that you do, but your patients still die of drug, drug overdose and AIDS. It must be very discouraging. She said, well, that's one way to look at it, but my mother taught me another way to look at it. She was, for all of her life, a, a teacher of uh, brain-damaged children. And she said to me, she said, now, Joyce, the key here is you don't look at the damage, you look at the image. You don't look at the damage that time and circumstance have done. You look at the image of God that shimmers underneath. The doctor said, I learned that best one night when 
they had invited my mother's class to provide the program at the PTA. And my mother rehearsed her class in singing songs from the Broadway musical, My Fair Lady. It never occurred to my mother that the parents would burst into tears because it never occurred to my mother not to let that eight-year-old girl in a wheelchair roll across the stage singing, I could have danced all night. I could have danced all night. The capacity to give thanks for what God has given in every life. Sometimes we do it in prayers, and sometimes we do it in the sermon. Another goal of the funeral is what I call oblational. Now, oblational means making an offering, and in one sense, this is the major goal of the funeral because the drama of the funeral is about taking our sister or brother to God and giving them to God, uh, giving thanks to the God who has given them to us. We make an offering. Sometimes this can become the theme of the sermon, however. Uh, we had at Princeton Seminary a music director and choral director um, who had uh, come to New York and then to Princeton from a little town in North Carolina because he knew he was gay and different, and he was not well accepted in his little town in North Carolina. Uh, he died of AIDS, and the body was shipped back to the little town in North Carolina, and the funeral was in a tiny little Methodist church. And some of us went to the funeral wondering what in the world would the minister say at that funeral? Would it be condemnation? What would it be? The minister did a beautiful thing. He, in a sense, imagined himself not in the pulpit but in the pews, and he made an oblation, an offering. He said, God, you gave us David, and we loved him, and now we give him back to you trusting him to your care. Sometimes the goal of the sermon is to announce the offering of the life of the person back to God. Next characteristic is ecclesial. There's something about a good funeral that lifts up to audibility and visibility the gathered community of the church. Uh, Sometimes you will be talking to a family about plans for a funeral and they will say, uh, please, uh, no hymns. We just can't sing at a time like this. And uh, the proper response is, it's all right, you don't have to sing. We'll sing for you. We will sing for you. Uh, there's a tremendous value in letting the voice of the congregation uh, be heard. Uh, in his book, Open Secrets, uh, Rick Lisher talked about his first Lutheran parish in the cornfields of Illinois, and he said, in the chancel of our church, uh, we had a stained glass over the altar, uh, and it was a stained glass of the Trinity, and there was a circle uh, with the three persons of the Trinity on it, Pater, Father, uh, Sanctus Spiritus, Spirit, Filius, Son, and on the outward ring in between each of the persons in Latin, it says, non est. In the middle is Deus, God, and there's a ligament that goes out to each of the persons with est. The Father is God, the Spirit is God, the Son is God, the Father is not the Son, the Spirit is not the Father. Lisher said that window stood over all of our services, Sunday, weddings, funerals, baptisms, all of them, and in a sense it stood there and said, any questions? <laughs> but there is a sense, he said, in which the ligaments of the Trinity represent the community of the Trinity imposed in its light on this community so that the goal of our discipleship was for our life to be gathered together in the same self-giving love that is represented in the Trinity. He said, you know, uh, crop dusting pilots who fly over our cornfields 
can look down and see paths in the cornfields where for generations neighbors have walked from their house to take care of a neighbor who has a need at another house. The ligaments in the cornfields beginning to reflect the ligaments in the Trinity. To lift up in the sermon and in other places in the funeral liturgy, uh, the, the notion of the connectedness of the community gathered around this event and this deceased. Uh, one of my friends who's a pastor in Tennessee was at a family night supper and he was seated next to a member of his congregation, an old farmer, and in the middle of the meal, the old farmer leaned over and said, Preacher, I think I need you to correct my theology. Correct your theology? Yeah, I think you need to correct my theology. You know, last Sunday when we were having the Lord's Supper? Yeah. Well, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I felt like my wife, Jane, gone two years now, that she was with us. And the little girl we lost so many years ago, I felt that she was with us too. My parents, her parents, and on and on, more than the eye could see. It just seemed to me like they were all there. I think you need to correct my theology. To which the pastor wisely said, no, no, you have it right. Every time we gather, they're all there, the whole community. And to be able to evoke in the sermon the presence of the whole host of saints gathered round, both those living and those gone on before us. It's one of the tasks of the funeral, one of the possibilities of the sermon. The next goal of the sermon is to be pastoral or therapeutic or to deal with the, with the grief. Now, we've, we talked yesterday about how the funeral had switched over to be grief management. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a place in funeral preaching and in the funeral itself for the pastoral care of the grief-stricken. We get, to, we get to preach, blessed are they who mourn. But the way we preach it needs to be uh, tenderly put together. Do you remember that wonderful sermon that William Sloan Coffin preached after his son Alex was killed in an automobile accident? And he said, many people have been sending me over the last week greeting cards and telephone calls and telegrams and letters and he said, some of the best, but some of the worst have come from my fellow reverends because they always quote scripture. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. He said, look, I'm a minister. I know those scriptures. I have told those scriptures. I have preached those scriptures. One day I will believe those scriptures again, but right now my grief has made them unreal. And to be able to respect that timing, uh, that pastoral care that needs to be given, the outrage of death and all of the pain that it has caused, the irretrievably seeming loss that people feel when they've lost a daughter or a son or a mother or a father, to be able to speak of that honestly in the pulpit is part of the gospel, the pastoral tasks of the gospel. Commemorative. If in the Eucharistic we figure out what it is we ought to give thanks for in terms of the deceased, in the commemorative movement in the funeral, we uh, figure out what it is that we're going to remember or want to remember this day about the deceased. This is the place to tell their story. Now, if you are in a situation where members of the family or friends want to have their five minutes at the microphone, I think best that is done at the visitation. It's best to carve out a space of time there to let that, because it always tends to be longer than people think it's going to be and less helpful than they perceive that it's going to be. If they're going to do it, uh, this commemorative piece can become a separate element, as the Methodists do in their service. They call it naming, as we mentioned yesterday. And you can allow uh, obituaries to be read and, and memories to be done. I find it generally helpful if you're going to have laypersons uh, speak uh, at a funeral in this section 
to ask for their remarks in advance in, in writing. Uh, what that does is you're not going to edit them particularly, but if they have to give them to you in writing, it imposes a kind of discipline on them. They have to whittle them and, and choose their words uh, carefully. But this is a good thing to do, either you or someone else, to tell some stories about the deceased. Not in order to eulogize them in a false way, but to remember them in an authentic way. This is the life that we have come to carry to God. This is the person. And it's not only uh, the story of the deceased, but the stories of those around the deceased. I talked to a hospice nurse one time who said that they had a woman in hospice care who was very proud of her appearance. And every day she would use what energy she had to carefully cough her hair and to put her makeup on so that she was presentable for the day just right. But then as the disease progressed, she lost the energy and capacity to do this. And so her husband, as an act of love, even when she was in a coma, would put on her mascara, would put lipstick on her lips, would comb carefully her hair, the nurse said, it looked terrible, <laughs> but it may be one of the most profound acts of love I have ever seen. To tell that story as a part of the story of the deceased, as a part of the blessing that commemoration can give not only to the deceased, but to the loved one. When Tom Lynch wrote his book, The Undertaking, which is about the funeral uh, industry, he said, Whenever he goes to pick up a body, the person who has been caring for the person who died always has a story that they want to tell. Um, it goes like this. He woke up in the middle of the night. He asked for a glass of water. I, I brought it to him. He took a sip. And then there was this heave, and he was gone. I woke up to a sound. I could see him clearly because the moon was out. And when I looked at him, I could see that his breathing slowed. And I watched him take his last three breaths. And the hard part is, I don't know, maybe it's the great part, is that everything inside me, the mother in me, was saying, go. It's, it's all right. It's time to go. I saw her hands changing color. They were getting blue. And I said, are you cold? Is she cold? Then it seemed that Mary was having trouble breathing. So we let the nurse know. And she came in and gave her a shot to make her more comfortable, and she was gone. There's stories just floating around in the air, and one way to make those stories sacred is to tell them uh, in a sermon, to weave them into the proclamation of the gospel. Next characteristic of a funeral is that it's hospitable. I didn't exactly know what to call this one because I'm trying to gather up a whole lot of things in lieu of evangelistic. One of the things that does a lot of damage is that when uh, ministers uh, out of particular traditions uh, sense that this is a vulnerable time and one that they can take advantage of to evangelize for uh, Christ. It's all right to let the emotion spill out of the cup. It's not all right to tip the cup. Uh, it's not all right uh, to take advantage of people's vulnerability uh, to encourage them to conversion. Now, uh, you, may, you may differ with me, but I, don't, I want people to belong to Jesus Christ, but I don't want them to make a decision to belong to Jesus Christ out of their fear and grief. Uh, I want them to make a decision out of joy and, and uh, freedom. So what is our responsibility, especially when at funerals we have lots of people in the house of God who don't belong to the family of God, who don't see them as a part of the church? What is our responsibility? And I think our responsibility is hospitality toward the stranger. And what does hospitality toward the stranger sound like in a sermon? Sometimes it sounds like education because we are telling a story in here that only the insiders know and the outsiders don't know the fullness of the story. And occasionally in a sermon you might say, you may have noticed that we put a, um, uh, 
a kind of blanket on the coffin when it came in. That's called a pall, and this is what it means. Or the reason why we do this in the service is because of this. And what you're doing is weaving them in to the fabric of the story of God, hospitality to the stranger. And finally, missional. Missional. Uh, this is a worship service, and a worship service always has in mind the mission of the people of God. And it is helpful, I think, on occasion to remind the congregation that this death is not a stopping place. That tomorrow morning we will get up and be about serving the world in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, especially if it is a mature family, uh, well woven into the faith, you can talk about not only this death, but the hundreds of deaths that are being observed in the memories of the congregation the parents that they remember burying before, the anticipation of those that they will bury and the care that they will give, and also the suffering and woundedness out in the world. That this death reminds us of the pain that is experienced in other places in the world, and we lift that up to God as well as our own grief. It becomes broad at that point and not, uh, and not narrow, the missional aspect of the funeral. Now, what I want to do is to uh, close by reading you a very brief funeral homily. I had hoped to project it on the screen, but it's too faint and doesn't show up very well, so you just have to listen carefully. Here's the circumstances of this funeral homily. Um, there was a man in a congregation in Atlanta, a Presbyterian congregation, who was bipolar and on medication. And he decided that he no longer needed his medication, and so he took himself off his own medication. Uh, his behavior became increasingly erratic when he did this, and his father was terrified that his son was going to do something terrible, not only to himself, but to others as well. And so one Friday afternoon, the father went over to the son's house and killed him, and then took his own life. Joanna Adams is the preacher, Presbyterian preacher. She is preaching a memorial service for two deaths, a father and a son, in a tragic circumstance. Uh, here is what she preached. The Reformed theologian Karl Barth said that people come to church on the Sabbath with only one question in their minds. Is it true? The providence of God, the saving power of Jesus Christ, the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit, the resurrection from the dead, the forgiveness of sins. Is it true? When we come to church at 2 o'clock on a Monday afternoon for a memorial service for two people who died untimely deaths, the question is even more compelling. Is it true? Can God be trusted on a day like today? There are other questions, of course. Why did it happen? Why did Mark get so sick? Why did Jim sink into such despair? They're the questions one asks late at night when sleep won't come and our psyches are demanding an explanation. We're only human after all, seeing through a glass dimly, trying to figure things out, wanting to know why bad things happen to good people who didn't do a thing to deserve the hand that life dealt them. We want to know why. Do you remember Rabbi Harold Kushner's best-selling book a few years ago? Most people thought the title was, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. It was actually, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. The Christian faith begins at the same place as the rabbi's book. Faith doesn't spend a great deal of time explaining why things happen to good people. In a world that fell from grace a long time ago, brokenness, illness, tragic endings are facts of life, inevitable, universal, unavoidable. Because we're human, we want to know why. Because we are only human, we cannot know why. The scripture promises that someday we will know why, but that day is not today. God knows what we need today is not an explanation. What we need today is faith. What we need is reassurance that the resurrection is real. God knows that beneath all our whys is the only question that matters. Can God be trusted with the death of those we love? We can live without an explanation, but we cannot live without knowing if it's true that God can be trusted. In answer to our question, yes, it is true.
God says, yes, it is true. Christ died and was raised so that Jim and Mark could live again. Eternal life is true. Even when fear and sorrow beat their restless wings close around us, it is true, it is true that God will lead us through the worst life can do. When the shadow seems so thick there can never be light again, it is still true. The comfort of God will seek us out and gradually, gently subdue our grief and restore our spirits. How have you endured all this? I asked Carolyn, Jim's widow and Mark's mother, on Saturday. God and the angels, Carolyn said. You see, we're not dealing today with a God who comes around only when things are rosy and the birds are singing. No, there's a cross up there. The God we know in Jesus Christ knows about suffering. The God we know in Jesus Christ gets to the valley of death, of loss and grief before we get there so that he can get ready to catch us when we stumble blindly in, so that he can guide us through the dark. As Carolyn put it all the way through the valley, Joanna, through the valley. It is true that God can be trusted. It's also true that bad, even unbelievably bad things happen to good people. Look at Mark. He could no more help his illness than someone helps having cerebral palsy or Hodgkin's disease. In a way, you could say Mark died more than his share. Bad things happen to good people. Look at Jim, a man of God who would have any day given up his life for his son, and he did in the end. A helplessness overcame him for which he was no match. It's also true that none of it was God's will. Don't you know that God's heart was the first of all hearts to break last Friday morning? Where is God in all this? Grieving with us, weeping for us, but more than that, drying tears, creating life out of death, hope out of despair, forgiving sin, restoring wholeness. God is so relentlessly committed to being the God of life that God can use even the worst that can happen in ways that we cannot fathom for God's good purposes. The question is not why bad things happen, but can God be trusted when they do? Should we hope again? Can we live again? If so, how? The gospel is so exquisitely clear and simple at this point. Abide in Christ, it says. Stay close to me, Jesus says. Bring your brokenness to me. Cut off from him, how could any live? But abiding in him, staying close to his body, the church, we can endure. I met somebody yesterday I'd not met before. Her name is Lauren. She's three years old, Jim and Carolyn's granddaughter, a bright, happy, blonde-headed little girl. She wore a bib with a duck on it and a ready smile on her face as she sat on Carolyn's knee and met the preacher. Tell Joanna what you say before you have your supper, Carolyn said. Lauren looked at me, a perfect stranger, and spoke as if she were sharing with me the most wonderful news you could imagine. God is great, Lauren said. God is good. And suddenly I could not wait to come to church today so that I could tell you what Lauren said and what the scripture promises and what faith knows even when pain is piercing and the shadows fall. God is still great. God is still good. It is true. Now, I, I don't know how you heard that, but I think of this as a rather remarkable um, sermon homily preached on the circumstance of a very difficult uh, tragedy. And so many of the characteristics that we talked about are found in here. There's the proclamation of the kerygma. There's the affirmation of the community, the church. There's the pastoral care um, of dealing tenderly with not only the feelings of the family about what has happened, but also the suspicions of the congregation that this may have been um, something that's sh shameful, which she wrapped in tender pastoral care and uh, healed uh, with her words. There's so much of that uh, in here. And I hope that uh, uh, you can see how uh, every funeral sermon becomes then not formulaic, but it becomes responding uh, uh, to this particular situation and thinking, what are the virtues that I should include in this sermon on this occasion? Well, thanks for listening. I think we're going to have some conversation now, I hope.